22. The Critical Church. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 14. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth the warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth the vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care of oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plough in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 27, Paul, having first dealt with some of the serious problems in the Corinthian church, turns to a spiritual and a spirited defense of himself. First, in verses 1 to 14, Paul answers the mean-spirited attacks on himself, and he cites God's law to vindicate his ministry. Second, in verses 15 to 27, he develops the implications of a God-given ministry. This he continues in chapter 10. More than a personal defense, Paul's argument simply relies on God's law. The law of God is no less valid than when first given at Sinai, and Paul cites it as God's eternally binding word. Their argument thus is really with God, not Paul. Paul is the Lord's servant. He is also an apostle. Paul does not say, I am beyond criticism. Rather, he cites God's law in terms of which all righteous judgment is made to vindicate himself. Up to this point, Paul has been placing Corinthian antinomians under the light of the law. His answer now to their criticisms of himself is to invoke that same law. Where men abandon God's law, criticisms flow from petty, personal and lawless grounds. Paul insists that the Corinthians, like himself, use only God's law as their standard. In verse 1, Paul asks four rhetorical questions which the Corinthians cannot rightly challenge. First, he is an apostle and he stands firmly on that fact. Second, he is a free man, not their servant, but the Lord's. Third, he has seen Jesus Christ in a vision. This alone is not enough, but combined with other attestations and the backing of the Jerusalem church, it stands. Fourth, they cannot deny that they are the results of Paul's apostleship. In verse 2, he reminds them that others have not questioned his apostleship, and the seal or verification of his apostleship is their conversion. Then, in verses 3 to 6, Paul answers his critics with some questions which are themselves also answers. First, whether an apostle or a missionary he has a legitimate claim to be cared for, to eat and to drink, verse 4. Second, he has the legitimate claim to travel with a sister, a wife. 
Sister can mean a wife who is a believer. Other apostles travel with their wives, as, for example, Peter and the brethren of the Lord, such as James and Jude. Are the only exceptions to this rule Paul and Barnabas? Verse 6. Third, when men go into battle, their expenses are provided for, and Paul's work is to engage in the wars of the Lord. Fourth, does not a man who plants a vineyard eat the fruit thereof? Fifth, the man who cares for a flock has freedom to drink the milk thereof. Why should rules valid in everyday life be invalid in the church? Then Paul adds significantly, I can call attention to these very natural facts, but even more, God's law sustains me. Verse 8. The law of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, declares, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Verse 9. God's law here has more than oxen in mind. A premise is laid down, namely, that in every sphere the workman is worthy of his hire. God, in giving this law, spoke entirely for our sakes, Paul says, that we might understand a basic premise of God's order, applicable to men and to oxen alike. In verse 10, Paul rams home the conclusion. The law is directed to men, given and written for men. That he that ploweth should plough in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partakers of his hope. This means that in every area of life this premise prevails, that the labourer, whether man or beast, is worthy of his hire, deserving of a reward. Paul then asks, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Verse 11. A material reward is necessary and proper. Others, Paul says, have been rewarded materially by the Corinthian church, are not we rather, as a founder, even more so entitled? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Verse 12 Paul has no wife travelling with him, and he normally supported himself with his tent-making, then meaning leather work. This gave him greater freedom in dealing with the problems in the church, although the Corinthian church was still critical of what little Paul required. Paul now reminds the Corinthians of God's law again. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 16 and verse 26, Numbers chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, Numbers chapter 18, verses 8 to 20, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 9, and chapter 18, verse 1. To be partakers of the altar means that, of what is given to God, a portion goes to them. Paul's use of this law is important. Antinomians are emphatic, especially that what they call the ceremonial law is abrogated. Paul makes clear that its premises are still valid. Christ's atonement ends the need for animal sacrifices, but it does not eliminate their meaning. As Paul concludes, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Verse 14. A belief current in the church is that it is spiritually good for the clergy to live a poor and meagre life. This is a lawless idea and against God's law. What Paul did in living sacrificially, he did for his own good reasons, not because he was not entitled to being well rewarded. A strong vein of asceticism is prevalent in Protestantism. It holds that the evangelical clergy should be required to live as meagerly as possible in order to be more spiritual. At one time, the manse was furnished often with the discarded furnishings of members, and the pastor's wife and children were expected to wear clothing discarded by members. This was especially true in Methodist circles. Such a view was blasphemous. One of the things modernists did early on was to insist on better pay and the practice has seeped into evangelical circles to a degree. And yet, over the centuries, Paul's letter to the Corinthians was taught in churches, Catholic and Protestant, with no embarrassment on the part of readers or hearers. It takes grace to hear the word of God, and grace appears at times to be in short supply. 
If grace requires a monetary response, it seems at times less visible. Paul here, as elsewhere, is forthright and blunt. Not surprisingly, Paul has been, over the generations, sharply judged by many who have good reason to dislike Paul. But Paul is the Lord's Apostle, an emissary from the King over all kings and lords. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 To disagree with him is to disagree with his Lord and our great judge. We must therefore remember that Paul plainly equates the privileges of the Christian ministry with those of the sacrificing priesthood. Such privileges clearly belong to the apostles, but Paul does not so limit them. The five temptations of Israel in the wilderness are worth recalling to mind. They were greedy lusting, idolatry, whoredom, provoking God, and murmuring or whining. These are all too prevalent in the church now as it was then in Corinth. 